Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this economy show for the Workers' Party. We have a great panel of economists and people with entrepreneurial experience tonight to share with you our ideas on a very important subject. The Workers' Party believes that we can't just redistribute the pie. First of all, we have to grow the pie. And if we fail to grow the pie in Singapore, our least well-off Singaporeans will be the ones who pay the highest price. We are not against growth. We want more growth, but high quality growth that benefits everyone and uh, lifts all boats. And to talk about these issues today, I'd like to introduce our panel. First of all, Hertin Ru. She is an in-house counsel with an international company. And next, Gerald Diam. He is a technology entrepreneur and a former NCMP in the 12th parliament. Next, uh, Jamin Slim. He is an economics professor at an international business school. And lastly, Yi Jen Jong, who is an entrepreneur in the education space, and he was also an NCMP in the 12th Parliament. So right now, we'd like to go to a video from our party chair, uh, Ms. Sylvia Lim, and she's going to talk about the approach that the Workers' Party has brought to bear when we talk about economic growth. Good evening, fellow Singaporeans. Glad you could join us. The Singapore economy has been overall very successful over the decades producing goods and providing services. This was due to many factors, including a strategic location, proficiency in the English language, and a hardworking people. Today, Singapore's advantage has been challenged. Many countries have acquired the ability to provide value-added goods and services. Since the 1980s, globalization has resulted in a borderless search for cost efficiency. China, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, India and the Philippines are holding their own as centres for outsourcing. However, after decades of globalisation, we have seen winners and losers. The working class and advanced countries suffered job loss as plants were offshored to lower cost countries. Singapore has had that experience too, with factories going to Malaysia and Vietnam. Singapore has benefited from globalization and free trade, but there is more insecurity at the individual level. There is no iron rice bowl today. For instance, we have over 210,000 gig economy freelance workers now. What should the government do to steer Singapore in this environment of VUCA? Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. How does COVID-19 change how Singapore does business, both domestically and abroad. The Workers' Party supports economic growth that is broad-based and inclusive. Our candidates have ideas and relevant experience to add to this discussion. Another key issue is population and productivity. During the debate on the Population White Paper in 2013, the government's position was that Singapore needed a population of 6.9 million to sustain a dynamic economy. This is particularly questionable today. With our population currently at 5.7 million, the COVID-19 outbreak here has already shown the dangers of housing too many workers in dormitories. What does 6.9 million mean? Shouldn't we be studying how to produce more with less? What lessons can we learn from other countries like Denmark and Finland, whose population sizes are similar to Singapore's, but have highly advanced economies? Another question is the role of the private sector. In Singapore, the government is active in business through its many huge GLCs. This is the case even in sectors where the private sector can thrive, such as commercial IT solutions and logistics. What is the status of the Yellow Pages rule, which was to guide the government not to crowd out the private sector? Is there a level playing field for SMEs to compete in? Finally, we should seriously think about how the economy can continue to generate good jobs. This is truly a challenge for the long term. Is there a risk that Singapore ends up with no niche other than being a financial hub where money is parked, but which creates few jobs? So Sylvia just spoke about how the world is changing with industry disruption, rising economic nationalism and many other changes. So the templates of the past will not show the way forward into the future. Past glories do not equate to future solutions. 
So I'd like to ask you, Jameis, as an economist who studied these things very deeply, how do you think the world is changing? How should we in Singapore respond to those changes? Thanks, Leon. I think it's important, especially in the aftermath of COVID-19, when we think about all the disruption, uh, the catalyst for change that COVID-19 has been for the economy, you know, disruptions to tourism uh, and travel, it's important to keep in mind as well that COVID-19 has also been an accelerant for existing trends that were already in the process of rolling out. So what are some of these trends? One important trend is the idea that we are watching uh, automation and more generally artificial intelligence really become, uh, come to its fore in, in, in the economy and how that is changing uh, the nature of jobs in, in, in the modern economy. Another important trend is something that already was in place in the aftermath of the 2008 global crisis, which was this idea that both financial capital as well as trade were in the process of slowing down, what's sometimes known as globalization uh, or glo deglobalization. And then and another third trend is rising inequality and the fact that labor shares of income has gradually fallen in all sorts of economies over time. In Singapore, this is especially bad, where out of every dollar, uh, workers just receive as wages just 43 cents. And this is stock when you compare to other economies. So Japan, for instance, uh, workers receive 55 cents of every dollar. And even in economies in the West, like France and Canada, it's closer to 52 cents on the dollar. So these three elements, I think, tie in together with a fourth element, which is a little more political e economy in nature. And there's this rising sense of populism and uh, this rising nationalist sentiment that we observe elsewhere. And I think if we don't resolve all, all these three impacts on the average person in the economy, we will start to see these come back to bite us. And I think that is exactly why it's critically important when we look at the economy for policies for the future, we really take into account the importance of rising productivity because the models of the past where what we observe, you know, artificial intelligence means that we can no longer try to squeeze uh, the model of low-wage foreign workers as well as uh, high-skilled foreign talent uh, in, in terms of raising productivity. So it's important really for us uh, to try to raise productivity in the economy. Thanks, Jameis. Uh, I think you make some important points. We need fresh strategies because the problem has changed. So, Ru, I'd like to ask you, uh, what do you think about how we can make our strategies um, not just more innovative but more sustainable? Um, yeah, I think, you know, as James mentioned earlier, I think one, uh, one key consideration for us in Singapore is um, the changing demographics of Singapore. Um, you know, previously we were told that um, there was a target, or I don't know if it was a target, but, you know, uh, population growth to 6.9 million. Um, again, you know, we really have to question, uh, you know, whether that is still sustainable, whether or what, what are the tools and the strategies that we actually would apply to ensure that, you know, looking to the uh, short, mid and long term future, whether or not, you know, uh, you know, our policies are the right tools to bring Singapore forward. Um, especially, and, you know, coming back as well to what uh, Jamin said about COVID, um, I think, you know, it's actually really shown, um, shown up the, the vulnerabilities, uh, you know, the, especially in the global supply chain. And, um, you know, one of the things that we've really noticed, especially, you know, in my industry at least, is um, this shift from true, what we call true globalization to, um, you know, as I think uh, James also mentioned, uh, as a shift towards uh, more localized supply chains. So uh, manufacturers are actually bringing um, their manufacturing plants into the continent where the customers are located. So I think in Singapore, we really need to be quite conscious of this and uh, maybe some of our strategies don't really have to rely on you know, a, a real true global network. And I think you know, coming back to sustainability, um, this is something that industry and even economies and national economies really have to consider. Uh, one of the uh, business leaders whom I really admire a lot, um, he came up with a vision for his company, um, People, Planet, Profit. Um, you know, so he and his team with this vision uh, are always considering what's the impact that their company or their business has on people, their people, the communities, uh, and the planet, and also obviously because it's a business profit. I don't see why this can't be applied to a national economic policy so that our people, our planet, and our economic growth 
are always considered in equal proportions. Um, and also, uh, finally, I think the last point I'd like to make is that um, our reliance on sustainability, uh, sus sustainable growth, um, you know, we can't uh, assume that there will always be uh, lower wage countries um, to which we can actually uh, import workers to actually make up for any shortfalls due to demographic changes. Uh, we can't always assume that they'll always be available to us. So, you know, our, our economy and our strategies really need to be uh, ag agile enough to, um, to adapt to this possibility. And I, I actually think that, you know, the time for change actually needs to be now rather than when it happens. People, Planet, Profits, thanks so much, Ru. I think um, you know, a lot of uh, uh, meat there that, that we should reflect on. I'd like to cut to a video now from Jen Jong addressing one of the issues that I think James and Ru talked about, which is productivity. And we all want productivity-driven growth, but we're still not there yet. So over to you, Jen Jong. To others, Singapore economy is the stuff of envy. Dear fellow Singaporeans, I would like to pose a question to you. Has our GDP been growing unsustainably to the detriment of ordinary Singaporeans like you and me? In Singapore early years, our founding fathers had repeatedly warned against having too many migrant workers. At the leadership handover to the second generation 30 years ago, there were around 300,000 foreign workers. My friend, this has jumped to over 1.42 million today, most of them low-wage workers. In economics, we learned that GDP growth is the sum of capital growth, growth in labour force and productivity growth. Singapore's productivity has been low for most of the recent years, mostly short of the 2-3% target set by Mr Taman in the past. With low productivity growth, Singapore has been expanding by throwing in more capital and labour. Grow the pie, they say. The rest will take care of itself. My friends, we already saw warnings way back. In the 1970s, our economic architect, the late Dr. Goh King Sui, warned that growing the economy by cheap migrant workers is bad and will cause growth to one day come to a grinding halt. In 2008, the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew even said that he was not sold on the PAP's plan at that time to have a 6.5 million population. It would not work for Singapore as a society, he said. Yet in 2013, the PAP pushed for an even higher 6.9 million population cap by 2030. Successive generations of PAP leaders have adopted a grow-at-all-costs mentality. For too long, we have kicked the can down the road from one generation of leaders to another to capture GDP growth in a quick but lazy way. Such methods will lead to unsustainable population growth, depressed wages for the bottom income earners, and vast social problems. We were promised the Swiss standard of living. We are not going the Swiss way. For many of us, we have gotten the Swiss cost of living, but not their standard of living. The Workers' Party had called for a dynamic population for a sustainable Singapore. We need innovation and courage, like Singapore did in the early years. We need the government to take the leadership to effect big changes to industries that persistently have huge dependency on low-wage and unproductive workers. The time to tackle this escalating problem is now. Let those in power know that you care for a sustainable Singapore. Make your vote count. Vote the Workers' Party. Productivity is a hugely important subject. After decades of Timmy the Bee, it seems that we're still not quite there yet. So Gerald, you're an entrepreneur and you've spoken about productivity issues in the 12th Parliament many times. So what's your take on this problem we're facing? Well, it's important to talk about productivity because productivity really contributes to economic growth. But there's another aspect of economic growth, which is uh, what we have been focusing too much on in the last 20 years, which is labour inputs. So there have been too many 
uh, foreign uh, workers being brought in uh, just to increase the, product, the GDP growth of our country. And so we really need to focus more on productivity growth. But unfortunately, productivity growth has been an aspect which has been a millstone on the economy these, far, these uh, past 20 years. In fact, last year it even dropped by 0.8%. So we need to really focus a lot more on how we can improve the productivity in our, in our economy. And really, in our economy, the productivity growth is uneven. For example, the construction industry is much less productive than, let's say, a finance and insurance industry. But if you compare the construction industry in Singapore with that of other countries, we are only half the, as productive as in the US and one third as productive as in Japan. So we need to really look at ways in which our low productivity sectors like construction can be, look, can be uh, uh, looked at into how to increase the productivity in those areas. One area in which is uh, probably a cause of uh, low productivity, and the industry has said this themselves, is that the large number of unskilled labor that's brought in, or a lack of skilled labor, is one reason that causes uh, low productivity. And of course, productivity is not just about putting in more work into, the, into your workplace, but really about automating. And many companies uh, find it difficult to acquire this expensive uh, productivity enhancing equipment. So one of the things that the government could consider doing, especially even for construction companies, is providing uh, loans of these expensive equipment to, con to construction companies so that they don't have to purchase the equipment themselves. And really there are grants available, but sometimes it's just too expensive even with the grants included. And another aspect of productivity growth is uh, to, uh, to bring in more local uh, workforce into the, co the construction sector. You see a lot of the, the workforce in the construction sector right now is focused on foreign workers, but if we can make it more attractive for locals to go into, we'll find that the, the jobs become better, the pay becomes better, and people can work more productively with each other because they're familiar with each other and they are able to uh, cooperate more with each other. So those are some constructive ideas that you put your finger on the problem, Gerald, which is that we have some sectors of our economy which are very reliant on foreign labor at very low uh, productivity levels. So how do we, how do we uh, localize those sectors, increase the productivity, and create good jobs you know, for Singaporeans? So JJ, I know this is a subject you have written about, and you've looked at other sectors where you know, we've seen this kind of model being made possible. So yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Thanks, Leon. Yeah, and to follow up on Gerald's point, when we look at, say, the construction sector and we look at other economies, like the developed economies like uh, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, the interesting thing is that although the workers there are paid a lot more than our local work workers, but when you look at the overall pro construction cost, actually it's not much different from the construction cost in Singapore. So, and you look at these economies like Japan, they have to build to withstand major earthquakes, they have to withstand typhoons, yet the overall final cost is about the same as Singapore. So definitely there's a lot of scope for us to bring up the productivity to many times, uh, at least several times more than what we are currently mm -hmm. arguing. Without increasing the cost. Yeah. 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 And also, in order to make a major change, we have to make a very big concerted change at the national level. So it definitely has to cut across multiple industries, not just one ministry to make, make that input. So for example, when we looked at the workers that we bring in, can we bring in workers who are already more skilled? Gerald mentioned that they are mostly unskilled. So at the source, can we have an ITE type training institute to bring them in so that they are already very qualified to operate our machines in, and to understand the processes that we need? Mm -hmm. And to look at how we can make this attractive and viable for, for locals that Gerald mentioned, let's look at say some other industries, like for example, nursing, or childcare, which say 10 years ago, or a little longer than that, um, the locals were not really going into these yeah. industries because it's not seen as a viable uh, long-term industry so for them. But now, after years of um, the effort at the national level, with scholarships, with good career opportunities, and the image change, the locals have started to go into this industry. So we really need to look at that for the construction industry as well. Thanks, JJ. I think uh, that is a very useful uh, point to, to, to talk about. And Jameis, I know productivity and the sources of economic growth 
you know, these are things that you have studied you know, professionally as an economist. How, how well does Singapore compare to other countries? What do we need to do differently? So if I may, Leon, build off uh, the arguments that both JJ and Jero have mentioned, I think it's something that we know productivity is ultimately one of the key drivers to sustainable economic growth. And Singapore has struggled with low productivity for a very long time. Economists that look at this issue in the 1990s argue, in fact, that uh, a lot of the so-called Singapore miracle was because we were able to increase our so-called inputs, increase our labor inputs, increase our capital inputs, and not so much because of productivity. And importantly, we have noticed that, uh, they noticed that a lot of that growth, uh, even in other newly industrialized economies, such as South Korea, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, they ended up outstripping uh, the productivity contributions that we have had in Singapore. So, you know, when you, st when you start to look, unfortunately, uh, this hasn't changed too much in recent times. You know, the National Productivity Board, that was formed way back in 1972. And this was followed by the Productivity and Standards Board, IE, Spring, uh, Enterprise Singapore. You know, it's a melange, and we've had commission after commission. And unfortunately, because we have continued to rely on this uh, model of economic growth, which basically involves increasing our inputs, we have ultimately uh, ended up neglecting indigenous homegrown productivity growth. Thanks, Jamin. So now what I'd like to do is cut to a video showing one of our candidates, Terence Tan. Terence uh, has been an entrepreneur. He's worked in the business sector. He's currently a practicing lawyer. And he's going to talk about how productivity is not the enemy of entrepreneurship. My fellow Singaporeans, the impact of COVID to our economy has been severe. A recent MAS survey suggests that our economy will shrink by 5.8% this year. Deputy Prime Minister Heng Swee Kiet had said in a recent national broadcast that our economy will emerge stronger, creating better jobs and business opportunities for all Singaporeans, and our society will emerge stronger, leaving no one to walk this journey alone. If elected, we mean to engage with the government constructively as to how these promises are made good, and also how vital and various pathways for Singapore, Singaporeans to live productive, fulfilling, dignified and self-sufficient lives can be built and sustained. Long gone are the days of Singapore experiencing double-digit growth. In 2019, our economy grew a meager 0.7%. A Swiss standard of living remains but a fable for many Singaporeans. Household debt stands at about 64% to GDP, an OCBC survey indicates that 7 out of 10 Singaporeans, if they lose their income, can only manage their living expenses for six months. In January 2013, our then Minister for National Development had exhorted our construction industry to take or make a quantum leap in productivity. He had just visited Australia and praised construction workers in Melbourne who had taken advantage of advanced construction techniques so as to erect a building in about half the usual time. I thought that the Honourable Minister might come back galvanised and look to see how he might encourage and support our entrepreneurs and SMEs by way of tax incentives and grants to research and develop similarly innovative solutions so that all our industries might be more productive and efficient. And also, how ITE and our technical schools might be suitably reformed and apprenticeship schemes fully developed so that we might eventually reduce our reliance on foreign labour. We need to look at ways and means of improving productivity for the long-term benefit of our economy. We need to look at how we create job opportunities and put more money in the pockets of our hard-working fellow countrymen. On 10th of July, make your vote count, Vote Workers Party. So that was Terence Tan talking about uh some of his thoughts as uh, someone from the business sector. And Ru, I'd like to turn to you and ask you, you, you work in an MNC and in an environment where you have access to a lot of tools and processes that many of our local SMEs don't have. There are a lot of schemes in place, a lot of talk about digitization and so on, but you know, what, what more do you think we should do for local SMEs? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's key to, to understand and to point out that um, SMEs and entrepreneurs, they actually face very high costs and you know, a lot of barriers 
um, to actually helping them grow. Um, you know, but, but you know, I think uh, di digitalization and you know, uh, new technology so is something that they should really explore uh, as something to help them uh, leapfrog. Uh, you know, to, to actually grow, and um, you know, they, they, they need, but they also need to think just beyond basic digitalization. Um, you know, and actually really harness uh, cutting edge technologies such as IoT, Internet of Things, um, to actually use that to enhance productivity. Uh, you know, we obviously discussed productivity earlier, and um, yeah, I think that's actually really important using uh, technology like blockchain. Uh, you know. Uh, cloud-based technology to really, you know, apply to their businesses, to their processes, to help them to be in really like really pole position, uh, to 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 take advantage of growth areas, um, to actually turn disruption into, you know, an opportunity, a growth opportunity. Yeah. So thanks, Ru. So you talked about going beyond, you know, just the basic digitization to embracing mm -hmm. uh, Industry 4.0, and I think this is something that uh, SMEs need to grapple with. And they need a lot more support in the course of doing that. And in Parliament and on other platforms, we've spoken about ideas to support our local SMEs to become globally competitive, things like setting up venture capital funds for former civil servants, things like being more flexible with our SME schemes to provide more support to companies who can uh, deliver better results. But when we talk about all these things, uh, they have to be paid for. So how is the funding going to be generated? And I think. On this point, I'd like to cut to uh, King Wee, who has a video talking about public finances. He's an economist with the Global Investment Bank, and he's going to share some of his analysis of public finances in this context. Hello, 冠状病毒显露了新加坡现有经济模式的缺陷。为了应付疫情，行动党政府和其他执政者一样，在财政预算中宣布了短期的辅助措施。这当然是必要的举动。不过，我们更该思考如何面对当前极大的恶化。以往
能在这片储备金的森林里遮阴，而更有效的为未来做出贡献。我们要的不是某政党所称乱花钱，而是更好的投资在国人身上，让国家将来能享有更大的回报。这次大选，我们需要扪心自问。是把资金投入海外市场、外国企业，让储备金毫无保留的增加，真的有那么重要吗？还是我们可以谨慎利用资金，投资本地中小型企业和本地国人，不让任何人掉队？我相信您的一票，可以成就新加坡美好的未来。请投工人党一票，谢谢。So that was King Wee on the subject of public finances, managing our reserves. So, Jamus, I know this is an area that's close to your heart. It's something that you studied as an economist. So, what's your take on this? It's important to keep in mind that, of course, there are often benefits and costs to imposing any of these policies. In the context of Singapore, for instance, one important benefit for having this so-called artificial constraint. On the net investment returns contribution at 50% is that it buys a certain degree of credibility, but even so, you know it's important to keep in mind as well that because there is already a super majority in parliament, it's generally relatively easy to im- implement constitutional changes. So personally, I'm not so clear uh, as to what degree of credibility these kind of uh, so-called artificial constraints might actually buy. Now. On the other hand, what you see is、uh, a number of perhaps significant costs. So one obvious cost to this is the, just this idea that, of course, if you're going to limit the amount of ret-、uh, of contribution you get from net investment returns, then what you need to do. Is to find other sources of revenue, and what is that source? Is typically taxes. So you're going to raise taxes on hardworking、uh, individuals instead of thinking about alternative ways in which we can raise revenue. So that's certainly one、uh, im- important cost. Another important cost, and I saw this、uh, very clearly when I was working in my previous job in the sovereign wealth fund, is just this idea that the sovereign wealth fund often operates in a fairly opaque manner. And why does this kind of opacity matter? Well, for starters, you know it's not so clear when the fund has mixed mandates. So, in one instance, you have a sovereign wealth fund that's supposed to grow the wealth for future generations. But at the same time, it's also supposed to offer us a buffer during、uh, times of crisis, just like we are observing with COVID-19. But any any、uh, portfolio allocator fully understands that when you're trying to liquidate. At fire sale prices, often you get something、uh, that is going to be a lot less value than if you were to sell it at、uh, at times when it's a lot more tranquil. So I think just this idea of opacity、uh, does not serve as well because we do not actually know exactly how these、uh, inv- inv- these returns from reserves are actually obtained. And and I think that is is ultimately going to be a detriment、uh, in the de- democratic society. So thanks, Jamus. I think you talked about、um, the reserves and also、uh, transparency and accountability of our sovereign wealth funds. So in Parliament, we've talked about those issues. We've talked about how we can slow the growth of the reserves a little, but not draw down on the principle of the reserves,、uh, in order to release more funds to invest in our people and our companies. When you talk about investing in our companies, Singapore is known for various industrial sectors, industrial policy. But when you look at all the industries we have, you know, is that really future proof? Are there gaps there? We need to be doing more to promote the industries of the future. Yeah, I mean, I think you know.、Um, now, I mean, I think in the last year or so, there's been a, a lot of increased awareness of the effects of climate change. So,、um, you know, as far as I can see, there's actually a lot of、uh, interest now、um, towards you know our、uh, green technology. So, I think this is really an area where we can do better. We can put more investment, put more thought. Put more support、um, into local startups who are actually active in this space,、um, you know, to help them grow from startup to you know a more stable、uh, enterprise, and then to help them expand regionally before moving,、uh, you know, to a more international setup. So、um, another thing to,、uh, to to bear in mind as well is、uh, some there's some studies that actually postulate that、um, you know we're actually going to reach peak oil、um, by the mid 2020s. 
So that really doesn't give us a lot of time. You know, the, the runway is extremely short because, you know, as you are aware, we are we are quite reliant on you know some more traditional forms of uh, oil and gas. Um, you know, our industry. Yeah, I mean, this is a industry that obviously traditionally Singapore has been very active in. Um, so I think you know that that fits in quite nicely um, with uh, a developmental plan that actually uh, shifts this emphasis from more traditional energy sources towards developing more renewable technologies, such as, especially things like EVs, the, the electric vehicles. This is something that's actually quite um, popular, not, not popular, but you know, it's, it's, a growth, it's a growth industry, um, especially when you start looking at the sharing economy, um, you know, things like Grab, uh, Uber, uh, you know, th that, that's actually really important. Um, and you see that actually, you actually do see an increase um, in the number of miles driven so things like EVs, I think, are an area, and uh, I think battery technology is also something that you know uh, companies like Tesla are really interested in. And I don't really see why in Singapore we can't, you know, we can't also explore these areas. And I think, you know, this 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 kind of like really fits in quite nicely with you know what we talked about earlier about a more sustainable future for our country and our planet. Um, yeah. So more more of these innovative activities should yeah. be done here by our local companies and not just all the innovation by MNCs uh, operating here. Yeah. So I think when we talk about local companies and entrepreneurship, you know, we have to go back to our people and our education system because basically our only resource are our people. So JJ, you're an uh, entrepreneur in the education space. Do you think there are gaps there? Do you think there are things we need to fix to, to, to breed more entrepreneurism and creativity? Thanks, Leon. So as you mentioned, people are our most important assets and we need to depend on them to effect this change in the whole um, way of thinking to make our economy sustainable because as the panelists have all mentioned earlier that if some of our old models are no longer sustainable we need to make that change now now when you come back to education and we looked at the what got us today is that because in the past we need to make sure that our people are educated fast enough so we treat we put it through like a factory system where we have streaming and then we have the kind of branding of the schools to, to put them to, to different tracks and so on and then we have a certain uh, model for them to, to in their career. But the problem is that today the whole climate has changed. So what sort of uh, uh, jobs they will graduate to, sometimes we do not know because they will take like 15 years to go through the education process and yes. things will have changed by then. So basically what we will need is to make sure that they are adaptable, they are innovative and the entrepreneur and how do we do that the challenge is that we are so good at training students now to go for model answers so there seems to be a right answer for, for everything but in today's world there is no right answers because even our government do not know the answer sometimes you know so basically what we have to do is to encourage this flourishing of ideas and the bonus in our young people and one of the ways to do this is to encourage diversity in the thoughts and to be able to challenge and to be able to speak up, this um, sort of change in the thinking cannot be just at the school level. It must be nationally. And this is something that the government must effect a change. So we, the government servants, the government itself, must be more open. So take, for example, our very famous comic artist, yeah, Sunny Liu. He has his grant of $8,000 revoked on the eve of the launch of his book, and he went on to win three Eisner yes. Awards, which is the Oscar of comics. Or you take, for example, the uh, banning of the show To Singapore with Love by Tan Ting Pin. So these are uh, things that actually yeah. can encourage people to think differently and to look at different viewpoints and to see how we can develop Singapore together even though we have different opinions. So Singapore has to be able to develop our youth to be more bold so that we'll be able to be more entrepreneur, to be able to handle diversity in ideas so that it's not one fixed idea that we are going for all the time. Thanks, JJ. I think when we talk about critical thinking skills, I mean, that's an area where the authors of the World Economic Forum Competitiveness Report actually said that Singapore uh, has room for improvement. And, you know, education is an issue that is very close to our heart in the Workers' Party. We've raised it in Parliament. We moved the motion on class size. And we put forward many ideas to enhance the role of education as a leveller in Singapore, providing equality of opportunity. And 
In the past, I think many Singaporeans felt that that was the case with our education system, but today I think it's, it's, it's very different. How can we go back to those roots? You know, what are some of your thoughts, uh, Gerald? I think one of the challenges we're seeing right now with the education system is that those from higher income families are finding them are being much more successful in the education system than those from the lower income families. And so we need to find a way to level that to ensure that so social mobility is maintained in our society, which is very important because those from lower income families must feel that there's a hope, that there's a, there's a pathway to be able to succeed in, in life in Singapore. Because without that hope, it's very hard to have that social cohesion that we, that we need as a country. And um, I think another, another aspect is to ensure that our social policies are, are protecting the lower income uh, members of our society. For example, in the recent COVID-19 crisis, the current COVID-19 crisis, the government is basically spending almost $100 billion of our reserves, or $100 billion including our reserves, to be able to uh, jumpstart the economy and help the, the people. But many people are also reporting that they are facing a loss of income, they're, they're facing difficulties, but they're not able to obtain the, the help that's necessary. I talked to a, a resident uh, recently who well, he is low in, working in a low-income job, but, and he faced a slight drop in his, in his income, about 17%, but that doesn't qualify him for some of the, the, the grants that require them to, to drop 30%. So I think there needs to be some flexibility on that, on that aspect to ensure that those that are on the bottom, those that are struggling, are not left behind because we want to ensure that everybody moves forward together. So you touched on things like inequality, uh, social mobility, social resilience. These are all topics, you know, Gerald, that you spoke about extensively in the 12th Parliament. What I'd like to do now is bring on Sharif, who's going to talk to us about redundancy insurance, a very key idea that the Workers' Party has put forward in Parliament and other platforms to address this whole question of social resilience. Puan Puan Setana Ai, Perkembangan Ekonomi Singapura yang pesat sedang kini menghadapi masalah. Hari ini, pasaran pekerjaan menjadi lebih kompetitif. Lulusan baru akan merasa lebih sukar untuk mendapatkan pekerjaan dalam enam bulan pertama setelah tamat pengajian. Pekerja pertengahan umur yang kehilangan kerja akan menghadapi cabaran pengambilan kerja. COVID-19 akan memburukkan lagi masalah kehilangan pekerjaan dan menyebabkan pengangguran struktur. Parti pekerja telah berkali-kali mengusulkan insurans redundancy. Baru-baru ini, pada 26 Februari tahun ini oleh pengerusi kami, Cik Sylvia Lim. Namun, Menteri Tenaga Manusia menolaknya dengan alasan bahawa ia mempunyai banyak kelemahan. Parti pekerja dengan hormatnya tidak setuju dengan Menteri Tenaga Manusia. Insurans redundancy dilaksanakan di banyak ekonomi termasuk Jepun, malah di negara China juga. Skim insurans redundancy yang diusulkan oleh parti pekerja hanya akan diperuntukkan kepada pekerja yang kehilangan pekerjaan melalui pemberhentian kerja. Mereka perlu menunjukkan bukti usaha mencari pekerjaan lain atau mengikuti kursus kemahiran diri dengan tujuan meningkatkan peluang pengambilan kerja. Kami mencadangkan bahawa pekerja rata-rata bayar hanya $4 sebulan ke dalam dana keselamatan pekerjaan. Majikan pula menyumbang sepadan dengan setiap dolar yang disumbang pekerja. Bayaran yang kami cadangkan adalah 40% dari gaji terakhir pekerja sehingga 6 bulan. Ia akan dibatasi pada RM1,200 sebulan dengan pembayaran minimum RM500 sebulan. Skim Insurance Redundancy adalah jaringan keselamatan sosial yang bertujuan untuk melengkapkan program semasa untuk membantu rakan sekerja kita 
melalui masa-masa sukar. Dengan adanya insurance redundancy, pekerja akan dapat menyara diri dan keluarga sementara mencari pekerjaan lain. Mereka yang berpendapatan rendah yang mempunyai simpanan terhad juga akan turut bermanfaat dari skim ini. Skim ini akan meningkatkan kestabilan kewangan dan kesejahteraan diri mereka. Ini seterusnya membawa kepada kesihatan mental yang lebih baik dan mengurangkan kebimbangan tentang mengikuti kursus untuk meningkatkan kemahiran diri dan peluang pengambilan kerja. Tuan-puan, sebenarnya grant sokongan COVID-19 dan pakej SIRS menyama sebagai insurance redundancy. Wajar untuk skim ini dikekalkan setelah krisis ini berakhir. Kita harus perkasakan lagi jaring keselamatan sosial demi untuk berdikari. Manfaatkan undi anda. Undilah parti pekerja. So, Gerald, you've done a lot of grassroots work, you know, engaging with residents. Do you think that this failure to implement redundancy insurance, you know, before COVID was a missed opportunity for Singapore? Well, I think redundancy insurance, you have to understand that redundancy insurance is an insurance scheme. So, which means that you have to contribute to the, the scheme before you can start drawing out. So, this it really was a missed opportunity because redundancy insurance has had to be done while the sun was shining, not when we are in the dark clouds right now. And so, but be that as it may, I think it's not too late to start doing that now. But it just highlights the fact that it's important to have many different voices in Parliament and outside of Parliament, and with those voices that are able to have the influence on power to be able to make the changes. Because otherwise, if it's just voices in the, in the wilderness, they won't be heard, and uh, it's, it, we won't get the, the policy benefits that we, we desire. So that's, that's why we are arguing for more representation in Parliament, more voices in Parliament, so that we can give you the bargaining power. So thanks, Gerald. I think you raised a hugely important point on diversity. We need more voices with the mandate of the people, the full mandate of the people, so that those voices will have weight to influence policy making rather than just being voices saying whatever those voices want to say. So on that note, I'd like to end our session today. I want to thank our panelists. I'd like to thank all of you who stayed to watch us. Uh, it's been a session about a very important topic that the Workers' Party is very committed to, a healthy economy, strong economic growth, a globalised economy, but growth that actually delivers benefits for Singaporeans, growth that is sustainable. And uh, a 45-minute session is not enough time to cover in depth all of the ideas that we've raised. Please do visit our website and look at the ideas in our manifesto and ideas which Workers' Party MPs have raised uh, in Parliament and our social media pages. And I'd like to leave you with this last thought. All of these ideas will be just ideas. They will not actually impact our lives unless we have the mandate of the people behind us. So please vote wisely. Please make your vote count. Vote for the Workers' Party. Thank you.